All right. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for joining us today as we're going to uh, be with the crew from Legacy Effects. They're going to kind of show us a little behind the scenes of how they create all the amazing characters they do. We're going to start by looking at the work of the concept artist. We're going to walk through the shop and see the fabrication. And then we're going to end up with the uh, puppeteers as they kind of show us what it takes to shoot on uh, one of their one of their puppets. So let's, I think we're going to start with Bowden, who is a concept artist at um, Legacy. Hi, Bowden. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, my name is Bowden Sturba. I uh, started with these guys probably about 16 or 17 years ago when it was Stan Winston studio. Uh, started out in the mold shop and then uh, Worked, worked up to the design room eventually. I'm actually in Milwaukee, Wisconsin right now, and I have been for nine years. So I've been working with Legacy and sending off designs and 3D models the whole time. So it's a pretty cool pipeline. Um, so uh, for this character, I'll usually get a deck or creative uh, images from Alan and the director and agency. Um, I'll share my screen here and you can kind of get an idea of what we end up starting with. Um, so these little guys uh, were sent as reference and they wanted something kind of cute, kind of uh, quirky, but a little, little strange. So this is, this is kind of what we start out with. And then uh, my first pass, I usually start out in ZBrush and uh, create a little character like this. Um, trying to pull from reference, get something cute, something uh, kind of quirky. Then I'll render that out, head over to Photoshop. This is kind of what I'm starting with here. Um, and he needs some fur based on the reference. So I'll just come in with some brushes and start pulling things out and compositing some different fur on top. They want them in a little cockpit, like a little uh, spaceship. So I end up with some kind of composite like this. Um, is there, is there I don't think we see- frozen? We frozen here. I might yeah, I think all we see is the reference images. Oh, okay, hold on a second here. So that didn't work. Um, it never works. This is how everything goes. We waste a couple <laughs> days with Bowden, yeah. trying to get him to learn how to play his instrument there. Okay, <laughs> let's try this. See if this works. Now you see in the Z tool. There you go. There you go. There you go. All right. So I can't. I can't fly around. All right. So here, here's the Z tool I start out with. That's in ZBrush. Create a little dude like this. I'll render him. Let's see if I can jump to a different uh, program here. And then I'll go over to Photoshop. So the render starts out something like this. It's pretty simple. Um, rendering fur, you can obviously do that in 3D, but a lot of times we need to move fast. So trying to get all that figured out in a short period of time, I'll just take some shortcuts. You know, we'll do a little smudge brush and pull out some fur and then Final composite looks something like this. Um, and then I'm going to head back over to the deck again. And uh, so when 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 Bowden and I work together, it's like I'll give him the directives from the uh, producers and directors. And then what's great about the first pass is you got to be broad. They have all these little references and they say, like the, we like it to be like a little owl, or we like the big eyes, or we like the fur. Obviously, they pull from probably a lot of the concept art that's on the internet and pro probably from a lot of people that are watching this right now, which we obviously can't use, but that's the inspiration for creating a new character. And then, so Bowden takes all that stuff. And what's great about, you know, the first pass is that it's very broad. Um, I think we've talked about this before, but you get a shotgun approach. It's like how, you know, we don't know exactly where they are. We're trying to execute that director's vision. And so what's fantastic is you, you get stuff that's loose and a wide range of things, you know, that's hopefully in the family of stuff they want. Uh, are you seeing the, these images now? As I'm, yeah, I'm these through. are great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, these, right, so the, these guys are kind of cute. And I think the first feedback was like, you know, they're cute, but they, we want it to be a little scrubbier. So we go with kind of some darker fur and um, this little dude over here, um, He's a little more meek and kind of sad looking. They kind of gravitated to him. And, and you'll see that this ends up being close to the final character. Um, so 
I end up going back to a couple rounds like that. We'll end up going to ZBrush. Let's see. And while he's, ooh, that's not anything we wanted to see. That's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's really important that the first round you get something, you can't just submit one image. You're like, oh, that one's really, really cool and super well executed and finessed. It's much better to be looser and broader to send them broad strokes and you know, like overall gestures than it is to get in the weeds with details. So that's what's great about, you know, it's a combination of ZBrush and sculpting and then photo bashing on top of it. Um, and, uh, you know, Bowden's fantastic. The whole, it, that's what you have to be. It's like you have to be very fast out of the gate to try and get ideas because then everyone's looking at one thing. They've all got ideas in their heads when they see the script written on the page. And then, but everyone's got something different. So and when we do our first round of designs, now we've got something that we're all looking at a common point that we can then go, okay, we like that, we like that, we don't like this. Let's go back to that reference. We like this from this reference. That's kind of the essence of what we're feeling. But until you give them something to look at that it's that we're all looking at the same thing that's original, that's when you can really start honing and changing and altering and giving variations. Um, yeah, so that was the Z tool. Um... And then this is, we'll kind of go through the final process here. So they narrowed it down to this little guy. And then we started playing with some cockpits, um, started playing with some different harnesses and stuff. But this was, this is end up being the final character. So what I end up sending off to Legacy, because I'm moving fast, a lot of times it's pretty rough, as they well know. So <laughs> it takes a lot, a lot of work on their end to clean up some of my rough geometry. Um, and then they obviously end up making it uh, come alive. So this guy ends up being the final, final character, which, you know, most of this is composited. Sometimes it's a, it's a full model and they can print the whole thing. But as you'll see, like most of what I think you guys printed were just maybe the hands, feet and mm -hmm. part of the face. But there's yeah. a lot that's changed because I'm moving so fast. I'm compositing the little antennas and the ears and the director yeah. likes these eyes. So that's all you know, in 2D. So they're going to have to obviously translate that on the floor. Yeah. Right. And that's what we need Bowden for is to get the ideas out there. We don't need him to refine um, everything on right out the gate, even, even color. We can, we can keep exploring that. But on a project like this, I mean, Bowden and I probably did a back and forth over this over two or three days um, because we're looking at building this character in probably three weeks. So you have to move fast. You have to go with gestures and then go, okay, we're going to take over that. And then we'll take pieces. And sometimes I'll ask Bowen is like, okay, now refine the hands and feet. And we get, we start breaking down the character to move in parallel because it's got a, it starts as this one image and then it's going to splinter out into six or seven or eight different departments. And then they all have to work in parallel and it all comes back together again to one puppet three weeks later or three months later, how much time we're given to do it. But this is the general workflow. Um, so then once we, we're happy with where Bowden's taken the concept design, we bring it in-house and then we got Adam and Darnell and we got a whole team of people um, that then take it to the next level of like, okay, now how do we make this workable and functional in the real world? Um, uh, for a digital character, it would go and like, okay, now we got to give it to rigors and and finesse it and get the you know the poly count right etc cetera, etc cetera. but that's kind of where we work with Bowden and then he and I will keep going back and forth as we we might have to explore colors um, or sometimes like in a character like this I have to tell Bowden is like I only have three weeks this is the fur that I have available to me and so we give him images and uh, he incorporates that into the design so that we don't go and have Bowden design something that we can't execute so there's a lot of back and forth handshaking at this stage because we could design the world, but then we can't build it. So, and then at the same time, it's like, well, I've got to, I've got to use stuff that's on hand sometimes, or that's readily available. And sometimes directors and agency will like, Hey, I saw this, this really cool fabric on the internet. It's like, well, that's a three month lead time. Can't get it. But what can we do that's like that? Um, so that's where we have to the do a lot of hand holding. I don't know. And, um, and then work with them to see how we're gonna execute it. So it's, you guide them 
you, you know, you know, if it's all digital, yeah, you can design anything that you want sometimes, but ultimately, you know, if you go, well, with the limited resources that we have, we can't make it furry because we know what that's going to do to rendering. We have the same situation in the real world. Um, it's got to be achievable. So then, um, when the, Darnell, do you have stuff? You know, once we take Bowden's, we get his Z tool and then we bring it in house. Um, and then Darnell will start prepping it to be 3D printed or taken out to the um, floor to be sculpted. But in a character like this, and mostly our workflow is that we'll do a lot of 3D printing and we just pick and choose. So like Bowden said, we're gonna do the head, we're gonna do the hands and feet. The ears will be sculpted by uh, an artist on the floor because we need to make them translucent or whatever the reason is. The fur is gonna be done uh, and then I'll go back later and like, give me eye options, Bowden. And then he'll do a battery of different color options while we're already building the puppet. Darnell, what do you got? What's next? So, hello everyone. So here's um, this, I'm gonna go through a little bit of the molding process, the digital mold making process. So things have changed. We used to make, we would always output all the parts 3D print the parts, get the parts, they'll go on the floor and everyone would mold all the pieces. But recently with the, with the digital process, it, it's easier for us at, to actually make molds in the computer so then we can get much more smaller pieces so we can make more detailed molds and smaller pieces easier than it would be for the people out there on the floor so we can get smaller pieces. This is a, even though this piece is not that small, but we could make very tight pieces that would be very difficult to mold. So you can see here is a representation of one of the molds that was made, um, that was printed. And then you're not was, looking at the camera though, Darno. I don't know where you're looking. No, he's, yes, I, I, pin, I pinned him, Alan, so that the main thing that people can see is Matt's um, camera. Oh, okay. I got Alan, it. stop awesome. messing me up, man. Messing up my pins. <laughs> <laughs> Darno, can you speak up? No one can hear you. Oh, you can't hear me. Okay, so the um. The so this is a representation of the digital mold after it was printed out. So now what I'm going to do is show you so you can see it has everything that we need in the real world as far as keys, cutters, um, bleeders for all the parts. And we usually speak with the, with the people on the floor. Like Alan said, there's a lot of like back and forth. We talk with the people to see what we need, you know, as far as like where we need to actually make our cutters, where we need the bleeders to be, um, how the mold needs to key together. Um, so that way, once they get on the floor, if it's going to be injected uh, for the material, or if it's going to be something that is, uh, if it's going to be a hard mold, like this is a hard mold, so usually the soft materials will go inside if the mold that we made would then be done doing something else. So that's that. Now I'm going to show you uh, the digital file of another part that we've made here. So if you could see my screen, let's see, I'm going to share screen with you. So can you guys see my screen? Yes, right. I can. Awesome. For once, I can. <laughs> so this is, let me just turn this off for a second. So for example, this is the foot from an alien that would probably be sculpted by Bowden, except uh, usually we would get the parts from Bowden, then like Bowden said, depending on what, how rusty he is and all those different things, we have to either go through and re-sculpt it or various things like that. We have to re-sculpt. So, see all that nice artwork Bowden show you? It's not like that. Everything has to be redone by me, <laughs> like everything. I'm like, Bowden, seriously, man, must we redo all your work? <laughs> but, uh, so everything gets re, re not always re-sculpted. Lots of times Bowden will send over everything and it's perfectly fine, depending on what we need. Lots of times, sometimes the scale is slightly off of various things. So in this case, this is one of the feet for a character that was sculpted by Bowden. And then now we're like, we would speak with the mold shop and they'll say, well, we need cutters that go down through here and through here and down through here and through here, right? So they'll tell us where we need it to be cut for what type of mold process that we need. And then that right now, I'm just gonna show you uh, just for ease of time, I'm gonna kind of, I've already built this mold. I'm just gonna kind of go backwards so that way you guys can see. So this, mold they told us had to be a three-part mold and then there had to be a cap and the mechanical department he gave us this piece which bolts in on the top and then 
once we got that piece from him, he told me, okay, this is what's going to be locked into your foot. Make your mold around that piece. So then that way, I'm like, okay, this is the foot. So that way, when they pull it out, pulls out the mold this way, all these bolts are going in. So there's a lot of like technical things that they're telling us and describing to us what they need to happen. And all that stuff just goes over our head. They're like, just, just tell us where you want the boat, the thing, and we'll make it. <laughs> but uh, so then after they just It's just funny because like, Darnell came from the mold department and he thinks that he understands this. <laughs> See, I, I, so did Bowden. <laughs> Bowden did all this on the floor. Yeah, it's, it's funny because me and Bowden actually both started in the shop, in the mold shop at the same time. We both were always competing for commercials and get trying to get our designs in there and even now to this day Bowden will design so like god dang it they picked Bowden's design yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's pretty awesome so I think me and Bowden we've been working together for a long time um the uh so you can see here depending on what we need so this part here shows clay cutter right so where the bleeding is because once you put in the material it needs to actually go somewhere. So if you're putting it into the mold, all the pressure is going to push back and it's going to push the material out. You're going to get bubbles and all these different things. So working in the mold shop, they've explained to us what we need. You know, so it shows we need bleach, we need this, we need that. We go through the whole process, they show us what we need and everything starts to move forward. So making the cutters in, that's what this purple line is. This other darker purple is where we need bleeder so you can see this darker purple lines going through and that's so that way when you close the mold the materials can come out so we have a lot of conversations and like alan said having worked in the mold shop for a couple of years before moving more over into the design area you start to understand how things need to work how it goes together and with the conversations with people but um then you just keep moving through all the pieces so we make all the cutters we make all the keys that's what these guys are here if i turn all this stuff off and if there's any questions let me know i'm just kind of moving through it kind of quickly you can see here the keys the keys is what allows the mold to lock together so as we saw on the floor if you don't have keys the mold starts to slide all over the place and it doesn't lock in so you put keys so it registers so making all the keys and various things depending in uh, so that way the mold can lock together and be secure. So yeah. I don't know. So um, I feel like, um, yeah, Dardano, I'm going to take over for a little second here. It's like, okay. you know, we'll show you a little bit of the 3D printing as we get into a different process, but we'll print the, the, the original character that you saw. We weren't, we didn't even like whatever that was two or three years ago, we didn't do the digital mold. We'd done some, but um, what we had done, here you can cover this now, Matt, I'll mute. So these are the actual prints of Bowden's character design. These are the hands, we 3D printed them, and then we did a little bit of cleanup, and then we made traditional molds out of them. This is Emma. So we made molds, some laid them all up. The practical version of what Darnell just showed you. Made a silicone mold. So this original hand, but, but, but. To put. So we molded this 3D print so that we could get a soft, flexible silicone version of it. So we would have to do that for the hands and the feet and the head um, on, this, on this character. So this gives us our working silicone. Pete, who you'll see a little bit later, engineered in the pick points and the hand mechanism so that it would grab and have armature wire in it and you could mount to it. Um, and he did the same thing with the head. But when it comes to molding and casting, this is kind of what's been done for decades and decades. And now with the, the digital version, go ahead and open this one on camera. 
So this is what Darnell was just showing you. Go ahead and keep opening it. There you go. So there's our plate that Darnell was describing that Pete and the mechanics gave us. And now we've got a we've got a mold that is basically geometrically perfect. These seams are so tight that they don't even go together. <laughs> Like that. You see, is like this. Is, this would take a mold maker days to make this, and the expertise involved totally doable on the floor. But what we're finding is that these things go together like puzzle pieces. And if you look inside, the seams are so clean and tight because with every character, you end up with this flashing of skin that you got to get rid of. And what it looks like when you trim it all the way down, you got one that's trimmed over there? Or unpainted, but trimmed? Yeah. So you end up with this one, but there's tiny little seam line that makes it look like a toy. And this is supposed to be a living creature. So we got to get rid of that. That takes us over to Chris over here. Hi guys, this is Chris Garsnickel. Hi everybody. So Chris is actually taking a fresh pull out of the mold and he's getting rid of all the flashing. You want to walk him through in a nutshell? Yes, sir. How you go from this to that? So the flashing is the resi residual silicone after you squish the two pieces together. And what I'm doing right now is I'm just going in and you can either trim it with nippers or you can trim it with scissors. And you just want to start pick away at all of that. And you go down to the base of the shape. Also where the meat of the silicone is. And then once you do that, you just start to flatten the surface out. Is there is there a time that now, you once you flatten the surface out and it does take a little bit of time, but once you flatten the surface out, you have a clean surface, and that's when you can start to detail and put the detail back into the silicone by sculpting detail out of the silicone, out of the same silicone that the pieces are run out of. You can start to sculpt that detail back into the piece with the same silicone. Okay, one second. You, you had a question? Yeah, I was just curious, like you're talking about the the digital molding versus, you know, the more traditional process, like this is obviously a lot more involved, like, is there a time that you would use one version over the other or is it like. They both have their strengths. Um, the, the digital one, when we really want to incorporate mechanical forms in there, whether it's an armature or mechanism, we get a very true mold. Um, all those ghouls that put in there and all those cutters are um, with, a, with a hard piece. So when we can put it in virtually, then we get mold department, art department, mechanical department, all working in there. They start with that same Z tool and we start molding it and he starts mechanizing it all simultaneously. Okay, sorry. Um, doing these kinds of molds, like the, the mold makers that do this professionally have been refining their art for years and years and years. So doing it digitally, it's it's actually easy to get lost sometimes when you mold. Um, but, but that's why we have our we have our mold department come and they work with Darnell to um, to figure out exactly where to cut it because there's a lot of a lot of experience that goes into knowing where to separate a mold. So um, it's cost, it's timing. Um, that, that, that's really it, is determine which approach to use. But we use all of it. 
if some if, if for those people that are watching because we have a lot of students and people that maybe are interested in getting into the industry like mm -hmm. or something like this with the mold making like is there anything that like what should the skill set set be that people have because obviously like you say these some of these mold makers have probably been at this for several years and the industry is yeah. different from when they started like what would you know what would your recommendation be for anyone that's listening that might want to do this type of work like i know everyone says you know learn 3d you have to learn how to sculpt in 3d but like there's obviously a lot of um skill and art that you know that we're watching right now yeah. um, like what would you say to those people like what what should people be it's, doing this is a very this is a very tricky thing that comes with nuanced experience and about understanding undercuts and separation lines um, and then how to support something in a space. So, you know, having done any of it in the real world always helps when you move into a full digital. Um, I'd say the same thing about any, you know, digital technique. It's like if you learn real color and painting and form, um, then it's just easier to do it when you have a new tool. Yeah. We um in the chat, Amanda was asking, is there a way to fix an armature underneath the mold or do you create access to it? Underneath the mold. Yeah, we we create access to it uh, a lot of times everywhere. Because what Chris is doing is he's recreating the sculpture. The seam line that's destroyed right here, that 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 is now um, sculpture that is now got a big heavy seam in it and you got to get rid of that so um we actually suspend things knowing we actually intentionally put in holes to support this mm. so that we know that the armature falls exactly where it's supposed to be because that's when you have someone like chris here you know that you can patch that hole it's it, it's better to have a very predictable set of holes and seams because we know that we can clean those up than to put something in there blind and then hope that you don't get touched down and your armature armature is poking through or it's too thin. So what's nice about the digital is that you can you can look at that and look at all your clearances um, before you're committed to making a physical mold like this. So I don't I don't know the best answer as to how to do it. It just comes with experience and doing it again and again and then honestly making mistakes. Right, and but there is but mean, there is still value in learning the traditional methods versus oh, just totally. trying to jump straight into. No, it's yeah, yeah. With it, with anyone who hasn't actually made a mold, this is hard to describe. You actually, we actually, when we teach someone how to do a, a digital mold, we bring them a real mold and go, "This is what we need, and this is why we need it." Um, because this is when you have a soft form, you can you can pull this out of a. I have a hard mold. Go back over here for a second. You can't pull a hard piece out of a hard mold. This one will squish and bend mm. and then pop out of there. But if this were a hard piece, you have to be even more uh, experienced with making a mold because there can't be any undercuts. So yeah. it's... um. We, we do a lot of digital molds with soft pieces. Um, harder pieces are much more exacting. And, and sometimes you just have to be able to look at this form from all sorts of angles and see where the undercuts are and where it's gonna get caught up in a mold. Because ultimately it's like, you have to pull it out of the mold. You have to be able to take this out and separate them. Um, one of the earliest mistakes that you'll make as a mold maker is that you'll get this nice mold and then your piece is locked inside. They're now fused. You can't separate this from this because it's captured. So that's where we, we bring our mold making uh, experts in and we go, like Darnell says, like put a line here, put a line here, put a line here. And um, we, still, we still make mistakes. But, this ends up in a very clean, very predictable mold. 
and especially when it's very small, you need to control these thicknesses because um, any little bit of waver and your armature is sticking through the surface of the skin, it, it's unusable. So um, we, should, we should move on. Okay. Um, so after Chris has patched a, um, all, the, all the seams on the camera, then it goes to painters and then we take Bowden's artwork and um, we mix up the paints. Emma, uh, talk through any of the process. Hello. So with silicone, you can only paint it with more silicone. So what I'm doing is I'm mixing some psycho paint and pin down to fit through my airbrush, pigmenting it with oil. And I like to make it really thin so that we don't overcolor the translucent silicone. One of the nice things that you'll notice about silicone is that shoot up into it, it's, it's translucent. Just like your skin, you see that translucency coming through your skin on the edges. That's what silicone affords. And so you don't wanna just blast it with paint. You put very subtle layers on it so that you still see through and they glow, just like skin does. I don't know if this kind of answered Matthew's question, but he was saying um, when looking at making special or practical effects like animatronic puppets, how is the process for designing mechanisms that can manipulate skin? Oh, we're going to get to that. Yeah, perfect. All right. Awesome. Stand by, Matthew. So you see, it doesn't take too much paint before it starts getting to look like this one that's a little further along. Would you would you always use airbrushing for painting? Uh, like, no, or... it's a combination of okay. airbrush, brushwork, but um, yeah, a lot of airbrushing, I will say. So Emma, what did you go to school for? How did you end like, because again- You're asking you what you went to school for. She can't hear you. Oh, okay. okay. What I went to school for? Did you go to school? No. Uh, that's great. I, I always love to, loved, I always to hear that. I watched a lot of videos. She didn't even graduate high school. I know. <laughs> I didn't even graduate elementary school. <laughs> Stay in school, kids. <laughs> well, I, everyone that here in the shop has a different story and a different way they got into it. Usually they're artists and talented and have studied, even if it's on their own, art and form and color and, you know. So some are, uh, have art degrees, some like Emma don't. But that doesn't mean they're not talented artists. This means they don't have student loans. So yeah, like when you guys are ever hiring, like that's not necessarily something that you're no. looking for. You're like, if you're talented, that's, you know, you're gonna fit in. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna move away from Emma. We'll probably see her a little bit later. And we're gonna go see Connie. Emma's been painting the, the hand you see. We were walking through the shop. Honestly, I can't look at. So you're gonna stare at my back. But after we painted with this character, it has so much fur on it that while he is doing the mechanism, uh, Connie and the the scene has been run. Connie is the skin. Hi. This is Connie. Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Connie Criswell. I'm the uh, work in the wig and hair department here at the Pizza. And I'm punching hair. So, what I'm basically doing is like that. Take off part of the arm, put it in the holder. And then, if you want to come a little closer, see what I'm doing. Grab some hair, and some of the silicone oil, and then you just push the hair 
into the skin. So it looks like it's growing out of the skin. And you can see I have directions marked on the skin so I know which direction to go into. And I'm pushing the hair all the way through so it comes out the backside. And then you can seal it on the backside so that the hair doesn't come out. And that's what I'm doing. And then you can trim it back and paint the hair color and style it afterward. And that's pretty much the finishing effect. So how long would it take you to do a head like this one? This would probably take a couple of days because it's so dense. There's so much hair in it. And you have to do one and two hairs at a time. So, so did you punch the entire design? He's furry is head to toe. Not the entire design, no. The original one had uh, the, it has the national hair tech. And then this face part, both of the parts of the face. What's national hair tech? Hair that is sewn onto a fabric. And it's a company in Massachusetts. And that's what they do. They, it's sheets of hair on, on fabric. So they use it for, if you point the camera up. What are we looking at? I'm looking to see which one has. <laughs> These guys? No. We don't have anything here to show you with national hair tech. We'll the puppet. Okay, we'll go back to the puppet. I was looking to see if maybe that was national hair tech. Nah. It's actually just fun for it. So anyway, it's a fabric that covers, you can do things like a big foot. The body could be done. Okay. So it's basically machined hair. It comes machined in big hair. sheets of fur. Exactly. And okay. it's on a stretch material so that you can make muscles and things like that underneath it. So if you have big creatures to do, that's how we do that. And then we finish the edge by punching or tying. Tying it being with a ventilating needle, which is what most of us wig makers use. And this is a ventilating needle. That looks exactly like the other one. <laughs> look any Completely different. different. This has a, it's curved and it has a hook. Whereas this is straight. So this has a little ledge right there and can push the hair into the skin. It makes no sense at all. <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, it's nice seeing you, Bob. Job explaining it. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, with, with, uh, part of what you, you can show some of these up here is like these are these are some wigs for a creature, and it's tied on in, to a lace, which you can't see, which is the goal. But this is a tiny little lace piece, and then with that little latch hook she showed you, the crooked one, this one, she ties these in and actually knots the hair into that lace one hair at a time. So right now she's punching, um, but. Uh, you can't punch hair into a wig or an actor's head. So you have to make a lace piece. So that kind of that kind of gets us to all the elements of the finishing. We've got paint and we've got hair work. And then the, the big body fur goes together. And um, where are we with Chris? Where's Chris supposed to be? I mean, uh, Pete, where are you on this list? Because we should go to Pete. You forgot to put me on the list. I forgot. Uh, oh man. So the other major elements of uh, construction that goes parallel is mechanical design. So this is Pete Clark. And so Pete takes. Should I do mine? Mike or your mic? I'm just one up. Okay. So you or should you you should do. Matt. So I, I thought I'd show you guys since since you already saw kind of the mold making process and um, and the seaming and casting process kind of generates um, skins almost like a little rubber glove I can use to then. Um, build mechanical armatures, mechanics that go inside the puppet um, to help it move around. And I can show you so something like this would then go inside 
the, the rubber glove that we've made from the character. And then it can be puppeteered to get to bring it to life. So what's interesting from this is that this is, this is Bowden's design, 3D printed and prepped for molding. Props, these are actually not the same models, but this one is. He builds within that same Z tool, gives it a skin thickness that we want, and that creates this mechanical core. And then he uses separate programs like TurboCAD and Fusion 360 or SolidWorks and makes this mechanized and makes it move. So we end up with something that he's working with the same 3D model Bowden gave us originally. Um, and he does that with hands and feet and especially with faces. And one of the advantages of that is that I, that I can be building the mechanics as they're getting molded. I can be building the mechanics before while it's still up in the design room um, because we are always working on such tight deadlines that it, we kind of need all the processes to come to land at the same point at the together. Um, just your mechanical design then? That's in program. So this is in, this is this hand right here in Fusion, um, Fusion 360. But then I, you know, there's also, um, sorry, of course, it's like a second thing, switch over. So there's a lot of hand shaking between up Adam and then back with the mold department and with the mechanical department. So here you could see an example of like what a very small head mechanism. This one has eyebrow movements, lip and mouth movements, eye movements, um, neck movements. What's that? Okay. We're gonna share a few screen. Oh, I mean, I'm, okay. So did we, did we lose that or lose anybody? Okay, all right, great. So the, the, nice, the, the next step would be is that Pete and Darnell and everybody, they start sending parts to the, um, the 3D lab. That's all, we'll, we'll meet Dean in a couple of minutes about that. But all these pieces start to come together to create the final puppet. Here's some other. So you can see, just for these two little hands, it takes eight eight servos to make a move. I'm curious, Alan, what would be the time frame to get to this process right now? Like, how long would you have been working on this to get to this stage? Well, it, it ranges. Okay. <laughs> but. To do this, something like this, you're yeah. gonna need weeks, weeks. Yeah. But but we've done versions of this, like the sim simpler versions like this one. This is a simpler version of the hand, a little less sophisticated. We did this for a gizmo puppet in what, three weeks, four weeks? Yeah, but that's including the whole puppet. Not yeah. Just the hand. <laughs> yeah. Oh, to get to this stage? Uh, yeah, uh, just to get to this stage right couple now. Weeks. Okay. Yeah. That's why we want Pete, Pete to start because this is complicated and time consuming. So we want to give him an asset as soon as we can. So as soon as Bowden's uh, artwork is approved, it goes out to everybody. So everyone's so working simultaneously. Everyone works on a parallel path, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you saw the digital version but of the, uh, the eyes in there. Yeah. Pete will be designing 3D printed pulleys. I think it would take days and days just to machine. But with the new materials with 3D printers, these pulleys you can print and have them the next day in assembly. And you can print them all 
all at the same time. So you get a pile of parts very quickly where the old days of making machine, <clears throat> machine parts would take days and days. But you'll see in here, there are a lot of machine parts. This heat uses the combination of brass and aluminum because the strength is needed. You want the confidence to know that as it needs to push skins around, sometimes 3D parts wants to flex. So they'll selectively go through and, and you can see it's a combination of different technologies. Uh, and you'll see some of this in our 3D lab. We use everything that we can find. They're all valuable tools. Very well, <clears throat> while you're at Pete, really quick, part of Matthew's yeah. question, um, he actually brings up Grogu's ears, mouth, and eyelid skin deformation because of the mechanics. Is there anything you want to speak to, Pete? Just since you were a, a pretty big part of the build on that? Um, I guess as, as far as the skin deformation goes, I guess the idea that we're working with is to try and emulate kind of like human tissue as much as we can um, in a obviously artificial way. Um, and so one of the things we do is, is really try to put as little structure in there as possible. So the skin is free to move around. We just have kind of small little tabs kind of it's glued down and, and is controlling it. But a lot of it's about sort of like designing something and then putting it. Oh. Up for designing a new. Sure. Yeah. Again, going to why we would choose silicone or foam, silicone skin qualities. Um, foam latex is a lot lighter. So when you got something bigger, sometimes you have to sacrifice one look over another and try and recreate it. Because of, of that one. Um, doing like this in silicone is great. But if it gets bigger than this, this silicone gets really heavy and hard to move around uh, for performers, et cetera. So this is kind of the end result of, of where we are. Yeah. Okay. So for this project, in, in about three weeks, we went from Bowden's design We've lost Matt's connection a little bit. To quote Adam, I think we should strap oh. the satellite on Matt's back. It's probably Darnell's fault. <laughs> um, is that, I don't uh, know if Alan's talking right now, but. Uh, I've got somebody over uh, there trying guys... to check on it now. Uh, uh, Matt, you there? Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Are you back up? Where I think so. Testing. Uh, uh, still running a little shoddy there, bud. Um, yeah, I don't know if Alan's out. Is Alan talking right now? Because he's at, if he's if he is, we can't hear him. I don't know if he's too far. No, I wasn't talking. Uh, oh, apparently we we've perfect. lost audio on oh. do you have do you have Matt's picture or no? Yeah, we have Matt's picture. I think you should okay, keep okay. your audio since your phone's closer to you. Okay, 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 okay great. great. So, so we'll go through my, my audio. audio. So, yeah, so now, now we end up with like, like Thank you. Uh, Emma and Jake and Connie, she's done the hair work. They've painted the skins. Pete's done the mechanisms. We kind of put it all together and we have now a character that's ready to, to move around. And over here, we've got Shane and Roderick. They're doing a little puppeteering. Um, but what happens sometimes is that they're like, you know what, this is all great guys and we love it, but we think that we want to make this guy a bad guy right now. We want to make him a badass and we want to weaponize him. And we're already so far into the build that now we've got to change course. So we go from this really sympathetic looking character um, to something that they say is like, we, we need him to be a little bit meaner. Uh, and this kind of stuff happens all the time is like his projects develop and you figure out exactly who the characters are. Um, so, but, but, uh, so now we've got the problem of like, okay, how are we gonna put armor and weapons on this little guy? So we also have the ability to take do we, do we have any of the 
Adam, do you have your little uh, scanning set up for this guy? Let's just show him how we would throw this together real quick. Where's Adam? Is, uh, Where is are Darnell you? over there? Hold on. I'm yeah. coming over. Oh, <laughs> oh is Darnell there? What, do I need of to? Of course, it's Darnell. You should oh. go over there. No, no, no. Darnell's there. So we know now that we got to do more to him. So we're going to make some uh, weapons for him. We've had a conversation with the directors and we go, okay, let's give him some gauntlets, give him some armor, let's maybe an eye patch. We're going to go into another design phase on him and um, see what we can do to make him different. Or, or maybe there's a second one. It's like, now he's got a nemesis and uh, we need to augment him in some way. We, now we're so deep into it, we can't build a second one. So maybe we're going to build one and we're going to accessorize him and um, shoot him friendly, and then we shoot his enemy the other way. So we're gonna go, okay, we're gonna do an eye patch on him, and we're just gonna do this kind of quick. We would take a little bit more time with uh, the real world. That's okay. Yeah, so the reason uh, they're doing this is in order to make new armor for this thing that already exists, the best route is to 3D scan it so we have an accurate model in the computer. Um, scanning does not work well on fur. It doesn't, you know, doesn't have a solid form to catch on to. So the places that I knew I was going to be designing armor for, I would wrap with uh, Kleenex because that's a nice white surface or gray surface is the best thing for it. And so this would give me a flat plane in the computer to be able to model freely and get an accurate uh, approximation of its size. So um, yeah, so it's like, okay, so now it's either his new personality or it's his arch enemy. And um, we got to get back down to the surface. Um, that's, you know, the body was never fleshed out. The arms were never fleshed out. That wasn't part of Bowden's original design. And even the head, now that it's got fur on it, is not the same. So we've got to make something that fits this on top of all of it. Um, so we'll, we have a couple of different scanning options that we have here. Uh, you often take actors out and have them scan uh, photogrammetry. Um, but, uh, the scanner that we have allows us to take our own in-house pieces, scan them, whether it's an actor or a sculpture, and then put it back into the computer. So we took Bowden's design, which started in the computer and brought it in the real world. Now we need to take something from the real world and put it back into the computer so that we can then do quick designs and modifications and generate some new parts for this character. So, that scanner right there, take it, process it. It literally is just a couple of minutes before. Now we have a digital version of this that Adam can then take and go, okay, how are we gonna look, make him look different? What are we gonna do for his, this guy's uh, you know, twin brother that's evil? And um, so that's what that takes us over to Adam. Hello, uh, can anyone hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, cool. Just double checking. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, is that coming through all right? Yep, we can see it. Okay, great. So, um, okay, so what I do is uh, for me, I ideate very loose uh, early on. Uh, let's see. Let's see. So I ideate very loose. So I'll start off with a sketch and uh, I guess kind of call it a cheat, but I uh, sketch out what I'm working on. And then I uh, turn the symmetry on in Photoshop. And this allows me to sketch freely and just come up with ideas. And this is not anything you want to spend a lot of time on if you're if you prefer to do things this way, but um, because you're never going to show this to clients. This is all just for internal ideation. This is for you coming up with ideas, seeing what lines work, what doesn't, what do you like? You want some earrings? What do you want? You want a Mike Tyson tattoo? Like, you know, you're just playing around with it. So I'll do a lot of these very, very quick. And then you'll wind up with something like this. And this lets you see what you want to what you like, what you don't like. You know, in particular, uh, moving forward on this, that eye patch is cool. It adds some asymmetry to the design. This is cool. Uh, you know, I like the spike element. I want to incorporate that. We have this 
futuristic thing going on here. I've seen a lot of that recently. I don't necessarily want to do that. That's two Cyclops. So we're going to do sort of a combination of, of these elements over here. And so once I do that, uh, I take a photo of the finished model. And I'm going to bring in the Photoshop. If you're going to uh, do things quickly, I usually eliminate uh, color. I'll knock it back, and then I will draw over it. Take, spend some more time fleshing something out. So when I came to when I went through the process, I realized, oh, maybe the eye patch should be more like the Deacon's eye patch from Waterworld. And I was like, no, let's keep it like in the monocle and give us some of the lights, more interesting. And then we have a gun, a weapon, armor. Do we want to give them some history? So I'll go through a lot of iterations of these, and then I'll move on to the actual 3D work. Um, I try not to spend a lot of time rendering too much if it's something just for, you know, ideation, iteration, or, or anything like that, because most of that polish and most of that refinement can be done in 3D, and it's also easier to do iterations once you're in the 3D program. Um, so once you're in the 3D program, this is sort of the finished piece. Uh, and you, we can see where the paper towels were shown in red, and we can see where the exposed fur areas were shown in blue. We can zoom in on some of the parts that we came up with. So all of this started off as, as a very low, uh, very low modeling. There's, um, uh, uh, there's a trend when you first pick up ZBrush to uh, start dynameshing and just jump into high poly and start sculpting. And that is not, uh, it's not recommended when you're trying to do stuff for 3D print and for production. There's gonna be multiple iterations and you wanna be able to go back and change those models uh, quickly and easily. Um, and so, and I have a video showing some of this process I can show. So during the process, you can see how low I actually started off using basic cylinders, keeping things grouped. Um, a lot of this is specific information, but if you're, if, your goal is to concept and model and design for uh, an industry like this. Uh, you, you need to keep your models clean. You need to do things uh, just as, as clean as possible uh, because you may not be the one continuing the project. Uh, you, you know, uh, someone else may jump in after you and if, it's, if you have a confusing or disorderly uh, project or something that has to be sculpted from scratch, that doesn't really help anybody. Um, Do you guys only just use ZBrush there? Uh, no, uh, we have a, a lot of artists that use different programs. Um, we have uh, ZBrush, Rhino, Blender. Um, I will Moy. say Moy. Yeah, uh, we have a, a Greg, amazing Moy artist. Uh, you know, but you know what they say, Moy money, Moy problems. And, um, <laughs> but uh, no, uh, the, the softwares are varied here, uh, but you do need to know how to work with your software to talk with each other's software. Got it. That What's interesting is that everyone comes with their own, you know, we don't dictate, other than we have a loose pipeline, we don't dictate the software that people use because if they have strengths in that and they can work quickly, then what we try and do is like make sure that like their work program works with everyone else's program because then they can work fast in their specific thing um like pete for the longest time designed in TurboCAD, and, and then he transitioned to fusion because we were moving more and more of the team into fusion um but you know we're like if he's fast in TurboCAD, let's use TurboCAD. so it's just a matter of handshaking that has to happen between programs that are designed for art and sculpture and, and that don't have the mechanical backbone that we need in order to make a mechanical thing. So there's, there's a lot that we've learned over the years of how to make these programs uh, talk to each other um, so that Pete gets what he needs out of it and um, Greg and Adam and Darnell get what they need out of it. Um, scale is always a huge thing. Programs like ZBrush don't work in the real world scale, but when you have to take it out into the real world, it has to be the right size. Um, that's one of the first things that you'll find people making mistakes about when they go to 3D print something. And, you know, when it's, you know, fractions of an inch, but sometimes, hmm, no, not yet. We're, we're going to Dean next. Uh, or, or Ben. I'm going to cover Ben. So, um, 
yeah, we, we, we let everyone just like try and work within what their strongest uh, and most comfortable programs are. Are you using your mic, Matt? Yeah, we're on. Okay. So Ben, introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Ben Baum, the 3D model work here. So Ben, I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt you once I introduced you, <laughs> because because they came to us at the last minute saying that we need a nemesis. It's like basically it's like we throw everyone in that we can. Adam comes and starts concepting, gets stuff designed. We're right back to the design process again, but we are now days away from shooting. So we've got to bring in the big guns like Ben and um, and spread the load. So Adam's gonna be doing. There's an echo. I don't know who that's coming from. Stay in this room. Close your door. Happens all the time here, every day. <laughs> so, um, yeah, now we we have to spread it out even more because we are now behind the eight ball. This should have been approved at the same time the character was, but we've got to we've got to make up the time. So we, we bring in as many artists that we can. And again, it's all about parallel. Um, so Adam's doing armor. And now they've introduced that there's lights in this armor too. So now we have to throw into our electronics department a last minute lighting request. And all of this again is gonna funnel through our 3D print lab. So Ben, talk quickly about your gun. Oh, so um, Adam gave me this sketch and he wasn't too, so sold on on what he did, so he gave me the opportunity to kind of, kind of a, uh, I don't know, go with where my instincts went, and so I came up with this guy, and uh, the the initial designs had some uh, predator kind of elements, so I used some uh, visualization or some some uh, design elements uh, that I thought would kind of match, and right now I'm adding some. Uh, some rifling to the barrels and uh nobody's gonna see that why would you do that <laughs> uh it's, it just looks cool because someone might see it you know, might might actually see it. Pick up who's this guy <laughs> that's just uh that's just an old cranky dude i my apollo yeah so i thought it'd be cool to have a little shotgun with a triple barrel rather than a double barrel. Like you did. Awesome. So then we immediately, just like in the real world, like that's right, then got to go, got to go, got to go. Let's process it. We got to get it to Dean. It's got to be painted and it ships tomorrow. So that takes us to our 3D printing lab. Thanks, Ben. Oops, Dean. Thank you. Is he in there? We never know where Dean is. I'm here. Hey, I'm Dean. I am our lead 3D print engineer at Legacy Effects. And uh, so I just received these parts. And as we've kind of talked previously, everything is hot all the time. So once it gets to me, I'm trying to get it on a printer as soon as possible. Um, you can see these parts, uh, you know, we had talked about them before a little bit, and I know that there's some high detail, but it also doesn't really need to function. Uh, they're just some parts that are gonna go on the puppet. They don't need to go under any like extreme stress or heat or anything like that. So um, they're just gonna be some resin prints. So I've done the work here to support the parts. So that's to make sure that the part prints correctly and that it has like a scaffolding structure uh, to hold it together while it prints. Um, these structures, a lot of the time, uh, you know, there's some delicate little areas because I'm trying to preserve the artwork as much as possible. You know, we're thinking about the entire process and the work that I do here um, is going to help down the line. You know, if I do a bad job of, uh, you know, processing these parts, it's going to take more time to finish and paint and all that. So I try and do my best in the time allotted. Um, you know, but there's also different processes for different printers. So I can show you, uh, you know, I'm setting up our MJF print tonight. 
And this is a completely different thing. So this is a powder printer. And this is uh, right now 328 parts in one build, all grouped together. Everyone's stuff in one build, just on top of one another. This is a ton of mechanical parts. And uh, you know, Pete was showing some of these parts earlier. And uh, they're going to be out of uh, fused nylon, so they're super strong. Um, but yeah, there's a different printer for everything. And you know, I'm also from my desk here, I'm also monitoring prints. So this is a FBM printer in the lab and I'm making sure it doesn't you know, turn into horrible spaghetti or something like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I just sent those parts to print. So let's go to the lab. While he's heading to the lab, I'm gonna show you some uh, footage of him growing that really quick. So it's a quick time lapse. You can see that shoulder peak. It's pretty loud in here, so I'll try and speak up. Hold on. <laughs> You're good. Ready? Yep. Okay, here we go. Do it. All right, so welcome to the 3D Print Lab. This is one of two labs we have here. This is the main lab, so it's lab one. Uh, it's pretty loud in here, so I'm going to try and speak up. I'll let you know if I need to pump it up. So come over here. These parts were printed on a carbon printer. And here's the parts. See, those are our uh, beautiful resin prints. So right now, they're still covered in liquid resin. Uh, you, know, you can see the liquid resin here. It with a projector underneath, it fused the liquid urethane into solid. So now I have my parts here. Here, spatula, and remove all the parts. And then you can see all those support structures on there, and they've been designed to just kind of snap away. Uh, there's little breakaway points so that it comes away without digging into the part. So once all this comes off, um, the parts will uh, take a little bath in some isopropyl alcohol to remove all this, you can see all this excess resin on there. Uh, and that'll all be removed and then they get cured in uh, a UV chamber just to cure any of the uh, extra resin on there. And then uh, they leave the lab and they go on to the next process. Um, you know, on any given day, we're running through somewhere between uh, 60 and 500 parts, depending on what's going on. Um, everything in here is running 24 hours a day. You can see we have a whole variety of printers here. go through a lot of material all the time. And, you know, we've really tried to transition from just printing parts uh, that are going to be molded. Uh, you know, you saw some printed molds earlier, but uh, we've really tried to move towards functional parts. So a lot of the printers we have here are printing in uh, materials that we can put directly on an actor on the suit, and it's going to, you know, be able to be held up to the stresses in that environment. Uh, you never know what's going to happen on set. And so uh, we like to overbuild things and make sure it's going to be able to be thrown against a wall or, you know, fall down or whatever. So we have a lot of composite materials we use, a lot of carbon fiber, a uh, whole variety of stuff. So, you know, as I like to say, it's kind of a negotiation uh, with the floor. Uh, you know, how does the part need to perform? What's it going to do so that we don't, uh, you know, uh, underserved it. Right? Um, yeah, so that's the process. Thanks so much. Okay, so once we have our 3D prints, we got to quickly do some body shop work on them and um, paint them. So we'll, we'll, find our way over to Jake and Sandy. Where are you guys? Jake, where are you? Matt's probably coming, but I'll go live here. Except you don't want to see my other mug. Let's see. This is Sandy. Hi. So Sandy's taking the uh, unfinished parts and painting them. So the same way that Emma is working, 
with organic skin textures. Now Sandy's Where's job, Sandy? He's, oh. he's at his station. So his job is now to take those flat gray. Go ahead, you take over. Flat gray okay. parts and introduce metal to them. <laughs> One of the last artistic states, stages. Everyone wants their time. And it's like everyone, when it comes to this, you'll see how many different departments. So Jake's got, this is, this is as it comes off the printer. And Jake stands and polishes, finishes it. And detail that might have been lost by some support. Couple layers of sandpaper, just some drip. Smooth it out. When it's finished in body shot, looks a little bit like that. Now you got to make it look like leather. And then we use an automotive primer to kind of even everything out and make our paint bond to the plastic. And there we have. Uh, Painted parts. Shoot over this way. Not too much over this way. What's the right? Little weathering so it doesn't look like it's reserved. You know, for some of the people that want to do this um, practical skin patch paint, sculpting. The Stan Winston School of Character Arts is a great resource. A lot of the crew here are teachers. Have you taught a lesson? Me? Oh, no, I haven't, not yet. I know Chris has. Yeah. Uh, and even a lot of our digital artists have contributed to their, uh, the school's educational videos. That, that was the Stan Winston School, Tim. The, is that, um, uh, do you have to attend that in person in LA or do you guys, is there online courses with that? Do you know? For Stan Winston? I don't know if anyone can hear me. I'm just talking into the void. Oh, no, we're yeah, all, sorry. We're I can speak little... to it if you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah any, anyone. Is, um... uh, so Stan Winston School offers uh, different memberships so you can buy individual tutorials. They're online. Uh, courses uh, taught by various effects artists go to Roger. Uh, the industry. Roger. Um, in tandem with that, uh, as far as the digital side, Stan Winston does offer digital courses and then Noman offers digital courses too that are more specialized. Uh, they, they go into video games and concept art um, as well as traditional anatomy and stuff like that. Um, also, I just want to speak because like I saw some people get excited when uh, some people didn't go to school for this per se. Um, the, just because you didn't necessarily go to school for it doesn't mean uh, you're not trained in it. So there's plenty of resources to get that education for free out there. Um, those two schools being one of them. So for doing any of this, you still need a foundation in art, design, you know, fabrication, creatures, anatomy, and all that stuff. Um, it just doesn't, you don't bypass it. <laughs> uh, so just because you didn't go to a specialized school for it doesn't necessarily mean you, you know, don't need to know it. It's it's very important. So yeah. Um, okay. We're gonna move quickly into the this is Roderick, Roger Catchatorian. Hi Roderick. Hello. So this is a eye patch for the character. And it needed three sections. It needed the big center section. So for the lower parts, I decided to use just a uh, which you can see now. But the uh, first center section, I decided to use programmable LEDs, uh, basically a disc like this. And uh, these can be programmed uh, with an Arduino and a Arduino sketch. I wrote a simple sketch here and all this does is uh, 
brightness control as well as color change. So the advantage of using a programmable LED is uh, not just the control of color and brightness, but you can actually program specific uh, actions and uh, animations if necessary. Yeah, we'll get, we won't get direction from production sometimes. So we have to be prepared and like make things up and show them options. It's like, we're not exactly sure. It's like what color they want, when they want to use it. But uh, you know, it's like, this is his nemesis. So maybe it starts with like, you're not sure who he is and it starts blue and, but it's like, goes red. Cause he's obviously the evil one with horns like that and the weapons that Adam designed and Ben designed. So again, short time frame. this might be in the real world. Like today, I gave this assignment to Roderick this morning. I was like, Roderick, we're doing this presentation today and I need you to do this lighting effect. And sometimes that's how it really works. Authenticity, kid. So it is, it's just like, let's add lights to it. And it was like, yeah, thanks a lot, Alan. Now we have to, Dean was like, no, we're not gonna remodel that with a Boolean through it. You're gonna have to grind it in a grinder and uh, drill the holes yourself. We don't have time. As fast as rapid prototyping is, sometimes it's too slow and you just gotta do it on the floor. So now that Roderick's finished the lighting effects, we're gonna go put that on our new arch enemy. So this is how it works. You just run right into set, like we're ready to roll and the lighting is just finished. So Roger has this gonna go on. Spend like that. Back, 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 back. The teamwork making the green. So your DK is going to say that's a little bright, blowing out the camera. We're going to turn it down. I like the red though. So typically, did the whole team travel with the puppet to set? Like, how many people? No, did... sadly, we don't get to send everybody. Okay. It's all very controlled and selective. Um, but the team that builds is the team that goes to to shoot and go puppeteer and operate because, like, nobody knows how this head works better than Pete. So Pete has been building and playing with this as he goes. So as he designs, he, he's, he's thinking, how am I gonna operate this? What is it gonna do? How am I gonna set up the radio? Um, you know, the eyes have to blink and open and look around. And if this, this little eye light goes out, someone's gotta fix it. So that's the crew that built it. Someone's gotta be there to maintain this fantastic fur, keep me all pretty. So that an artist goes along with it. Stuff, you know, these these are literally working prototypes. So the people that built it and designed it need to be there to fix it because invariably something's going to go wrong. Um, they're going to ask for something that we didn't quite plan for in a little bit later, and um, we have to be prepared to ad lib. We have to be ready on the fly. It's like, how's this going to work? Oh, you know, no one's in the ears. Here's a little radio for the ears, Jake. Oh, hold on, Jake. Bring it over here. 
Nick, hold on. There we go. So we have ear movement, eye movement, eye blink, full rod puppet body so that he can do whatever he needs to do. Badass. Now, warrior alien. So we do this step all the time. Matt, so now you get to see Matt. That's, there. That's our resident videographer. And he documents the whole process so that we can be sharing all of this with the creatives, the director, everything that we've done with you today, we do for the creative team. So they see the process. They see their character being developed, start to finish. And um, because it's so fast, a lot of times we have to go, hey, how are you feeling about this yellowing in the fur? Is that good for you? What do you think about the age here? Should you have a scar? Because it's very interactive. It's very fluid and organic, this whole process. This happens way too fast to design and then sign up on the design. And it's just, we, we need to be in constant communication with the creatives. So the, uh, do the directors often come, the directors and producers or whatever come down to the studio often to approve this type of stuff? Yes. Or are you sending videos to them? Yeah, we, we do it all. Yeah. It's, you know, especially in the last few years with COVID, it's, yeah. it's all remote. Yeah. But um, yeah, we have them come, they'll come and direct us in rehearsals before we're shooting so that we get a sense of the attitude. The piece feeling is like, this is too playful. No, we need a more badass. Yeah, awesome. Um, there was a question by uh, Taya Corey that I wanted to address. Uh, so it was, what, what tips do you have for artists who want to use puppets and practical effects in films but have very low budget? Um, <clears throat> so uh, what, what you're seeing here is decades of this process being refined and new technologies being implemented and, and everything. And I mentioned researching older techniques is a good start um, because there's, you know, it's not like all that goes out of style, you know, uh, you know, metal can be wood, latex can be, or silicone can be rubbers. Like they they used minimal materials to achieve these things back in the day. Granted, there was a simpler aesthetic for, for some things, but you can refine that art and you can use the old techniques and do things, uh, you know, it, it we use all of them. Easier. We don't abandon any sort because that practice that you had doing it the old way, sometimes you just, that's what you have to revert to. You don't always have the ability to have 3D printers at your second call. Uh, sometimes we'll get calls like, hey, we got this, we got this cosplay artist that says they can do this for, you know, a couple thousand dollars. I was like, well, you should go with that guy. He's very passionate. And he's very creative, and that kind of environment is very, um, it's very creative. And they can come up with things that you might not think of because necessity is the mother of invention. But like, but when it's that this complicated, I mean, you've just seen what we did today. There's 15 to 30 people that built this puppet over a matter of three weeks. You know, one guy in his garage is going to be challenged to do this, but he might come up with a technique that we look at cosplayers and go, that's awesome. We need to do stuff like that. How can they do that in the garage? So we're constantly looking at how people do things. Our industry is notorious for stealing and borrowing from other industries and then applying it in a different way. Uh, Matthew in the chat was asking, you know, you were mentioning COVID, like what has, has there been any silver linings or surprising things that have benefited the pipeline for you guys? COVID? Yeah, just uh, because of the way you guys do things. I don't know if there's a silver lining for COVID. Not really. No, it, may, it makes it harder. I will say, well, I would just say the one thing about COVID is that we have had more communication with production because they make themselves available for Zoom calls almost a little bit too much. But there was a period where you didn't have the whole team together um, with 
props, wardrobe, special effects, director, cinematographer. Now you can get all those people together on a call and you can see each other and talk about it. Makes sense. So that is, that is actually one upside is that we, we can talk to more of the crew. Because for a while, everyone was an island. No one talked to each other. Nobody was storyboarding. We just thought that it would magically show up and work. Yeah. Any other questions for our little guy here? No, I think I, I think the only other thing we've kind of talked about it a lot is about getting into the industry. We've talked about school. What would you guys be looking for from a portfolio for people that were maybe interested in working at Legacy Effects? A good solid art background. But it's all about potential. Every in a, in a really good work ethic. These are challenging times, and so you have to be willing to, to you know, work hard. Um, it's do managed. Guys, the budgets and the time frames are short. So, do you guys uh, do on-the-job training? Like, would you do you have junior positions where people would you know if they want to work their way? You know, you're talking about you know, Darnell and Bowden's kind of starting out in the mold shop or whatever, like, is that mm -hmm. some, is that a path that still exists yes. within Legacy? Yes, it certainly does. Yeah. Very cool. We, we are, we are trying to bring in new people all the time. Um, Amanda saying, <laughs> I don't know where you're located, Amanda, but uh, she was asking, where's a good place to get oh okay she, I just answered her question so I guess basically living in LA is still going to be yeah or someone that's the design it's the, the work that we do here you have to be here yeah uh, we use both we use we use concept artists from all over the world because that part is okay um, but okay. at a certain point we have to take those designs and bring them in house in order to make them so that we can execute it and, and realize them in the free world. And to chime in on that part as well, like I remember when I first got the industry, I um I drove, I lived in San Francisco, I drove down, I went to visit all the places and bring my portfolio and I checked out all the different shops. I think I drove down, well, I only had one day down. I drove down, checked out about four or five shops, went to Stanwood Studios, went to uh, uh, Patrick Tatopoulos place that I put in my portfolio. And literally, that was the first question everyone asked, oh, well, where do you live? And I said, oh, well, I live in San Francisco. And everyone was like, well, as soon as you get to town, uh, come back by. You know, So I think definitely location is very important, being in the area. Yeah, because technically, legally, we're not allowed to ask you where you live. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. HR tells us, like, nope, that's not a question you can ask. If they're willing to make the commute, whether it's to San Francisco or down the street, <laughs> that's on them. Wow. <laughs> That's bonkers. Um, it's, it's true. Yeah. Uh, Matthew is asking if he were to apply for a junior position um, for next summer, like how far ahead should he be looking to kind of connect with you guys? Oh, as early as possible. We have a, um, you can go to hire me at legacyeffects.com. And uh, Damon and I get those uh, emails. Um, we're not that great about returning everyone's email just because we're so busy doing a lot of stuff, but we save all of them. And then when we have a, a crush and we're looking for new talent, that's where we go. But with something like an internship, that's, that's a little bit different. Um, while we don't have an internship program per se, we basically bring people in and, you know, if it's just an entry level or minimum wage, we have to pay people. We're yeah. not like the studio session of the slave labor right. interns. Wow. This has been very cool. I'm going to um, wrap it up unless anyone else has any more questions. I saw a few on here. Uh, I don't uh, know if I guess this is for the puppeteers, but what's the most complex creature you've puppeted? What's the most complex puppet you've puppeted? <laughs> kind of loaded, but... You've done a lot. Some of them haven't come out yet. Really. <laughs> the uh, raptor from Jeff Marvel's Jungle. 
Did you guys hear that? No, it was a bit muffled. The raptor. Uh, so um, one of the main designers on. Um, did you just speak a little louder? I hear myself. Oh, I would say probably uh, one of the most complex, but also one of the most fun was Old Lace, the Old Lace character that was a velociraptor on the um, Marvel show, The Runaways. Um, that was a, a really fun character to do and challenging. Any other questions? Is there anybody left? Did we bore them all? No, no, no. Everyone's everyone is still still here. Um, someone said, "Who is your favorite creature suit actor to work uh, with?" Definitely, definitely this guy named Dane. We worked with him a couple of times. He's oh, <laughs> fair there. enough. I like that guy. <laughs> Dane uh, there that we one. go. <laughs> Hi, Dane. We like we like Double D. We work with. Him I don't often. know. I saw. I it's saw this guy was looking for. To see how to connect on this. Missy Rosas is fantastic. That's right. Ryan Steele, exactly. Doug Jones, the yeah. illustrious Doug Jones, famous. Missy Rosas um, just got an award for all of her work, Dane. I don't know. Yeah, Dane, <laughs> you got some catching up to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's, there's one last question that we'll take before we uh, say goodbye. Sure. But have have any of you worked with stop motion puppets? Stop motion. Yeah. Matt is a stop motion. Yeah. We've all done you know, our own versions of stop motion. Professionally, Matt's probably the most experienced. But legacy but a lot is of the stuff that he builds is stop motion armatures for these puppets. Very cool. Um, yeah, well, I think Damon said, if anyone, you know, anyone that's listening today that wants to get in touch, you can address Damon um, and, you know, just to, so that he kind of look out for any emails that come in. But mm -hmm. if anyone missed the beginning part of the uh, panel, this will be available to watch for the rest of Lightbox. And it will also be up on um, Concept Art Association's YouTube page. Um, so I'm just going to type that in the chat. Um, and yeah, thank you guys for this has been crazy awesome. Um, it's really cool to see. I don't think I even realized how much work went into to all of this. This is amazing. Um, but yeah, thank you guys. Um, You're very welcome. Thanks for letting us share a little yeah, bit of the inside of Legacy. Yes, very cool. All right, I'll let everyone have their evenings back. Happy week, have happy weekend, everybody. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks.